belong. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, you belong here? We are so glad that you decided to be part of Faith Church. We're one church with two locations. So whether you're joining us here on the Anderson campus or the Pendleton campus, we welcome you today. Those of you joining us online, we say we are so thankful that you have joined with us as well. I would like to start by saying thank you to Pastor Al because last week he did an incredible job filling the pulpit and we're so thankful for his ministry. Matter of fact, just a great reminder that, that community in the church is not optional, that, that without community we really aren't even the church that God has originally planned for us to be. And so he gave us a line that I thought was just a powerful line and we like to visit it once again. And this is what he taught us. The purpose of community is to make us a family and give us a place to belong. Huh, maybe you wanna say that with me. The purpose of community is to make us a family and give us a place to belong. I, uh, I, I want to settle kind of a score, if I could, before I teach today. And, and that is, there's been a little tension between Pastor Carl and Pastor Al. Uh, and so I'm going to ask them to come up here, if you would please, and join me right here on my right-hand side on this stage. <laughs> and the reason, the reason there's been a tension, I believe, is because, well, they're, they're very much alike. Matter of fact, they were born, <laughs> they were born on the same day. Uh, so, yeah, kind, that's odd. Uh, they might be twins, we're not sure. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie, it's a possibility. But they, they were born on the same day. They wound up going to the same Bible college. They became uh, roommates, they got an apartment together, and when they married, their families became friends. And all along the journey, they've been having this competitive element. They're just both competitive. And 4th of July, if you were here, there was a challenge. And the challenge was this, that... Uh, who out of the pastors could win on that bungee cord run? And, uh, and I think the clear winner of the day was Pastor Carl. And, and <laughs> until Pastor Al talked to me about it, and he said, well, Pastor Wald, he said, you didn't know that Pastor Carl cheated. <laughs> Which Pastor Carl said, I didn't do anything that wasn't in the rule book. I just kind of stretched things just a little bit. It stretched things. Just a little bit, right? <laughs> and so, in order to settle things today, uh, matter of fact, where's, where's Peter? Right back, oh, right back there. <laughs> You're supposed to be strapping those legs together already, if you would please, my friend. We're going to do a three-legged race. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to see how well they can do. Now, now when they do their three-legged race, we're going to have uh, some incentive to make it worthwhile. As a matter of fact, I think the incentive that might motivate both of them is in my wallet right now. Yes. Let's see, there's Praise the Lord. two. <laughs> we're, gonna have, we're gonna have revival on the platform today. Hallelujah. All right, so I've, I've got uh, two crisp, brand new $100 bills. Yeah. Now, what we're gonna do is, in this competition, we are going to have uh, Peter stand on one side, I'm gonna stand on the other side, and we're gonna hold the $100 bill. Now, what they have to do, though, is they, <laughs> they have to make their way to the $100 bill and get it, but they only have 15 seconds to do it. We'll see which of them is better at stretching at this point. <laughs> you, you got it covered, yeah? So, <laughs> No, now, now that might be that might be cheating, or at least stretching the rules uh, as much as possible. So we're going to do it. We're going to do a little survey ahead of time. Let's figure out who you think is going to win this competition. All those that think it's Pastor Al. All right, we'll try it again. Pastor Carl. Pastor Walt. <laughs> I love you guys. All right. Are we set and ready to go? All right, ready. you think we ought to blindfold you? No, 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 no. <laughs> All the young people are, yes, maybe they'll get injured. We can film it and get on funny videos. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Who, who has a timer on their watch all ready to go for me? Anyone, anyone wanna do the timer? Thank you, yeah, uh, help me. No, 15 seconds, who's gonna help me out? 15 seconds, right there, help me out. Stand up if you would, please. All right, then if you would just count like 10, 
Five, when you get to the 10, five, and go, ah, when it's ready. Are you ready? All right, have you got to set it on 15 seconds? Well, that'll work. You can go backwards. It'll be fine. <laughs> the Lord hath provided. Or maybe it was just James. I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, we, sorry. I gave the genius to the wrong person. All right, so, Peter, you're a lot closer than I am. I think you're going to have to get a little further away. All right. Now, now, right there, it's just about right. Okay, now do me a favor. If you guys would scoot forward just a little bit, and here's why. We have a guitar right there. Oh, no. <laughs> Learning to lean, learn. No, 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 no. No use of furniture. All right, are we ready, guys? Whenever I say go, then let's start the timer. Are you ready? On your mark. Get set, go. Oh, it might be Pastor Carl. Oh. <laughs> ah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Time is officially up. All right. Now, now thank you gentlemen for humiliating yourself in public. I appreciate that. Sorry. Uh, because you did not get there. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter, would you mind standing right over there again? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna give you a second chance. But we're gonna before we do that, we're gonna make it we're gonna make it even shorter time. All right. Now here's how we're gonna do it. Because we're gonna look at a portion of scripture found in Amos, chapter three, verse five. Amos three, verse five, and, and here's what the word of God says. As a matter of fact, it's not coming up, so I'm gonna read it right off my paper. How can two walk together unless they agree? How can two walk together unless they agree? How can two walk together unless they agree? Help me out. How can two walk together unless they agree? Now, wouldn't it be incredible if rather than competing, that if they work together? Let me show you how, e let me show you how easy it would have been to get $100, okay? Let's, let's, kinda, let's walk together for just a moment. You're very slow. It might have taken a while. And you could have had that right there. But you cannot, because you didn't walk together in unity. Give these guys a big hand, would you? I am thankful that I get to keep that money. My goodness. You see, the truth is that you can't spell community without unity. And the model that God gave us for the early church is found in the book of Acts, chapter 2, starting with verse 42. We're going to read the, the blueprint, if we will, for the church that God intended for his church to be. But before that, we have Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 41. And that's where we have what we know as the day of Pentecost. And it was an incredible day. There was 120 people that gathered together for prayer for 50 days. We don't know if they came and went, but this much we know, the focus for 50 days was that they were going to pray for the promise of God to be poured out upon them. They didn't know what it would look like. They didn't know what it would feel like. They just knew they had a promise. And so they gathered together for a season of prayer, and suddenly, the Word of God says, the Holy Spirit moved the place. It was shaken. It was like an earthquake that was taking place. Not only was the place shaken, but it appears that there was a, a, enough noise from the earthquake and from a sound of a, a, like a tornado, a mighty rushing wind. And then people started looking in and they saw what seemed like fire that was coming down from heaven. And then it kind of separated and went on top of the heads of everyone there. An incredible encounter with God's Holy Spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and power. And then Peter went out and he started to preach. And the church grew that day. Okay, the church, the church in day one started with 120 people. And then by the end of the day, there's 3,000 more people added to the church. That's going to give you some church growth issues right there. How many people wouldn't mind it, though, if we grew to 3,000 people in one day? I wouldn't mind it at all. Well, then just a short time later, Peter preaches and 5,000 people are added to the church. So they went from 120 to 3,000 to 8,000. And someone said, we better pray about how to start a church. And, and so they, they asked God for a blueprint. And this is the model that God has given us. It's Acts 2, verse 42. And here's what the Word of God says. They devoted, they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the 
fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They were in unity. They were in one accord. In fact, that word right there that, that we translate as together or one accord as unity is used 11 times in the book of Acts. Only one other time is it mentioned in the New Testament. So how significant it is to the early church. They were together. They were in unity and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had legitimate need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread, there it is again, in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's pretty cool. Thank you for the amen over there. All right, that, that, that is the picture of the early church. And, and I was reading that this week and couldn't help but ask this question, why? Why are we as postmoderns not experiencing the same thing that they experienced in the early church? Because it was common. Every day people were getting saved. And sometimes they had church and 3,000 people got saved. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see that God did miraculous things by the hands of the apostles, but the word of God says that we can do those things and even greater things than that. And there were signs and wonders and miracles and, and crippled people that, that start to dance and blind people that can see and sick people that are healed and, and miraculous provisions and, and deliverances. And, and I can't help but question why. Why do we not experience the same thing in the modern church? And my assumption is this, that God has changed. Oh, well, that couldn't be it then. Because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God didn't change. So if we are not seeing the same thing in the church, it isn't that God changed. What changed? It was us. It's the church. We have changed. And I think as we look at the book of Acts with those 11 references to unity, perhaps one of the reasons why we don't experience the fullness of God's power is because we lack the unity that God desires for his church. There's, there, and when there is unity, God's power and favor is released. And if you and I desire the power of God, God's Holy Spirit moving in our lives and our church like it did in Acts chapter 2, then here's what we have to do. We have to be in unity. We have to have the same mission, the same passion, the same purpose, the same desires, the same goals, and the same prayers. And if we do that, it creates an environment for God to do the miraculous. So with this in mind, I'd like to take a quick look at Five powerful benefits of community. Five powerful benefits of community. Number one, community empowers our prayer. Community empowers our prayer. Acts chapter one, verse 14. They join together constantly in prayer. It's just a regular part of what they did. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that they gathered together for prayer all the time. They prayed. When there's an opportunity to pray, they prayed. If you came to church and you weren't feeling good, they prayed. If you came to church and you felt good, they prayed. If you came to church and you had a need, they met it and they prayed. You came to church and you didn't have a need. You blessed someone and you prayed. They prayed all the time, continually, constantly in prayer. And I think one of the problems with the postmodern church is that we stepped away from co community-focused prayer. We still kind of emphasize the, the individual prayer, and that's powerful, and God answers those prayers, but there's something about corporate prayer that God loves to invest in. And I grew up in the church. How many people you spent the majority of your life attending church at some point, right? And if you were in a spirit-filled church, then I can tell you what Wednesday night was when you were younger. Wednesday night was prayer night, right? And everyone gathered together for prayer, but something happened and the church evolved. It modernized and it became a little more acceptable. And so we went from prayer to teaching. And we went from teaching to, to kind of our own personal time, and, and, and I'm not against teaching because I kind of do it for a living, all right? So I'm not against it at all. And I'm not against personal time. I wish I had a little bit more of it. Anybody here wish they had a little bit more personal time, all right? But has the church walked away from the power of prayer 
and in doing so, handicap the blessings that favor God on our lives. Second Chronicles chapter 20, we're going to be reading from verse 3 and 4. It's a story about Jehoshaphat, and he was the king of Judah. And Israel is separated, and so uh, half of Israel is, is Judah, and there's three kings that have made alliance, and they're on their way to Judah. And along the way, they're just annihilating everybody in their path. If you got in their way, they got gotcha. you. And they were just killing kings and wiping out kingdoms, and, and they're coming straight toward Judah. And as they're coming toward Judah, the king of Judah starts to panic just a little bit. And the reason being is because he didn't want to die. Because they're going to kill the king, and, and they're going to kill his family, and they're going to take all this stuff, and the, the kingdom's going to be divided. And, and so he decided that it would be a good idea to talk to God, which so many of us do when we face difficult times. We find ourselves then feeling the urgency that maybe we need to talk to God. And, and here's what the Word of God says in Second Chronicles, Chronicles 20, verse 3. Alarmed, and I think that might be a little bit of an understatement right there, I think if you kind of translate it David say, totally freaking out, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Personal prayer time. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. So he said, by the way, he proclaimed, he made a law. Everyone is going to stop eating and everyone's going to start praying because we are at desperate times. And you say, well, I'm hungry. And he says, well, you won't be about this time tomorrow because they're going to kill us all. So we're going to fast and we're going to pray. Corporate prayer. The people of Judah came together. There's that word again. They came together. They were in unity. They were in one accord to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And the result of them coming together was absolutely incredible. It winds up that God gives them the, the, the strategy for victory. And he says, by the way, they're going to be coming this direction, I want you to go out there, but I don't want you to bring weapons or anything because this battle belongs to me. And that was an act of faith, to be able to go out to their enemies without any weapons, and the king said, we'll take it a step further. We're gonna send out the worship team. I don't know if he is mad at the worship leader or if he had a lot of faith in them, but sure enough, he sent out the worship team and they started just praising God. And the great thing about this is they praise God for the promise before it was given. If you want to see the power of God released in your life, let me encourage you to start to praise God before the promise is fulfilled. Praise God before the promise is fulfilled. No matter what you're dealing with, I'm going through a difficult time, but praise God, I've got a promise. Praise God, I've got a promise. Praise God, I've got a promise. Praise God, I have a promise. And start to praise him before the promise is fulfilled. And they begin to praise him, and the word of God says that, the, that God's Holy Spirit said ambushes for the enemy that they were attacked by God. And when you're attacked by God, guess who wins? God. God wins the battle, all because God's people got together for corporate prayer. Acts chapter two, starting with verse one, is the day of Pentecost, and let me, let me read to you what happened when, when God's people got together, 120 people, and unified prayer. By the way, it'd be easy for us to pull together 120 people today in unified prayer. It could happen again. Acts two, verse one. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. Would you say that with me? They were all together. They were in unity. They were in one accord. They were in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and, and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All this happens after corporate prayer and unity. They were all together in one place. Number two, community empowers our faith. Community empowers our faith. You see, faith is the, is the instrument that God uses to release the miraculous, to do signs and wonders. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. The apostles perform many signs and wonders. All right, if you're wondering what that means, signs and wonders, a sign is just something miraculous that says God is here. Something miraculous that says God is here. And wonders, wonders is this, that when you see something happen, you go, ooh, I wonder how that happened. Right, so there's signs and wonders, right? It's a sign that God is here, and it makes you wonder, how did that happen? And you, when you start to wonder what happened, you go, that, that must have been God. 
And so there were signs and wonders among the people. All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. They met together. Acts 2, 43. Again, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. There we go. We hear it again in the book of Acts. There are signs and wonders, wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Unity contributed to the miraculous move of God in the early church. Matter of fact, it was when they were in prayer, God's Holy Spirit came, they were in unity, and God sent thousands of people to the church. God did the miraculous because when we are in unity, it creates the perfect environment for faith to develop. Matter of fact, the Word of God says, when two or three agree and ask God for anything, it shall be done for them. And we're going to look at that in just a moment because I've asked for God for things before and I didn't get them. And, and I think sometimes we way underestimate the, that word there that says agree. When two or three agree. When two or three agree. When two or three agree. Kind of rhymes. Sounds like Dr. Seuss. When two or three agree. Right, when two or three of us come together in agreement, it's, it's not, I think we put the emphasis on two or three. But there's two or three. Two, two people, two or three. There's two or three. Would you join with me? You're two. But, but I think the power is supposed to be on agreement. We agree with the promise that God has given. We agree. Community, number three, community empowers our favor. Favor is released when we are in unity. And when we, when we practice a spirit of generosity, that, that God's, God's blessings are better released in environments where God's people are generous. If you're stingy, all right, and I don't want to be like the bearer of bad news here, but if you're stingy and you say, you know what, I just, I, I'm just not giving to God's kingdom. If you're stingy and say, you know what, I don't help other people. I mean, once, once, you know, someone caught me outside of the gas station and they asked if I had my change and I gave them the change, but, but I really don't like change. If you're not generous, you're handicapped. You're handicapping the move of God's Holy Spirit in your life. It's hard to get amens on that one. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. All the believers were together. They were in unity. They were in one accord and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Generosity then releases the favor of God. And my observation for the modern church is that we are not experiencing God's favor in its fullness. And perhaps it's because that we are we're cheap. And, and I am going to be the first to confess, uh, breaking the spirit of stinginess was a, a major work in my life, all right, because I'm cheap. Any, any cheap people here? All right, I, I still have clothes from high school. <laughs> I couldn't put them on my leg, all right, but I still have clothes from high school, right? I, I, I'm cheap. I, I, I eat at restaurants that don't cost very much. Uh, not because I think they taste better than fancy restaurants, it's because I'm cheap. I buy used cars, and I drive used cars until they die. You know why? Because I'm cheap, all right? I'm just cheap. And so when it came to having a generous lifestyle, it was difficult for me. It took the move of God's Holy Spirit to break that off of my life. But God broke it off of my life. When I first started tithing, I did it because I was cheap. And that sounds weird because you're saying, why would you give 10% of your income to God if you're cheap? And it's because I believe what some preacher said. And he said, if you are a tither, it releases God's blessings into your life and you'll have more than when you started with. And I went, I'm cheap and I always like more. And so I started to be a tither because whenever I tithe, and it, it was true, I tested it whenever I tithe, there was more coming my way. And maybe we don't see the outpouring of God in our lives, maybe the favor of God because basically the church is cheap. I read some statistics just this week. They were alarming. Here's what I read. Only 6%, 6% of confessed Christians are actually tithing. All right? And, and tithing is a biblical principle of giving 10% of your income to God. I'm not, this isn't like an offering sermon or anything, so you, know, you, don't, you don't have to get nervous. You don't have to walk out or anything. We're not going to take an offering at the end. I'm just telling you what the statistics are, all right? Uh, then 72%, though, good news, 70% gave something during the year. 28% of people consider them Christians gave absolutely nothing at all. And I know the defense mechanism is kicking in right now. Well, there's no tithing in the New Testament. 
All right, and, and that's an Old Testament principle, and that is true. All right, there, there's no reference to tithing in the New Testament. You know why? Because they gave everything to God. All right, and so if you think tithing's bad, woo, you're not gonna like the next message, right? Because this is what they did. They thought everything they had belonged to God. When you gave your life to God, your stuff came with it. You say, I want you to be Lord of my life. And they said, oh, that means my stuff. You're Lord of my stuff. And if you felt like God said, there's a person there that has a legitimate need, then take some of your stuff, sell it, and help them. They gave 100%. I don't know about you, but all those cheap people are going, I believe in tithing now, my friend. <laughs> right? And, and maybe that, that stinginess has, has handicapped the generosity, the favor of God in our lives. And Acts chapter 2 reveals the principle of generosity. And unity and generosity release the favor of God. But when we are stingy and not in unity, it handicaps the favor of God. Haggai chapter 1 verse 5 and 6, it warns us of what happens to us when we live a lifestyle without generosity we walk in a life without the fullness of God's favor. God's favor. Here's what the Word of God tells us. Haggai 1, verse 5. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. All right, so there, there are certain times that you might say, well, I believe the author was putting in his own words. No, no, no. He's quoting God right here. The Lord Almighty says this. Give careful thought to your ways. <laughs> I'll add my, oh, stingy people. <laughs> Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. He's saying, you work really hard, and you haven't got that much to show for it. You work really hard, and you're still afraid that the economy's gonna crash. You work really hard, and you still check the stock market on a daily basis. You work really hard, and there's just not the amount of reward that God would like you to have. You eat, but never have enough. You just can't be satisfied. No matter what you have, you want more, you want more, you want more, you want more, you want more. You drink, but never have your fill. I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You say, by the way, the things you buy don't warm the soul. All right? They do not meet your physical or spiritual needs. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. I don't know about you, but I have experienced that. That before I became a generous person, I was a stingy person, and whenever I was stingy, I would keep all my stuff. And when I got all my stuff and all my money, I put it in my wallet. And when I put it in my wallet, at the end of the week, my wallet was empty. It seemed like no matter what, there was something that was causing my wallet to be drained out. That I go around the corner and I have a flat tire. I go around the corner and I had to go to the doctor. I go around the corner and, and something had to be replaced. But when I became a generous person, it's as if that hole in my wallet was sealed up. And God says, what you have will go further because of the favor of God in your life. I'm not gonna ask you if you give or if you don't give. I'm gonna ask you this. How many people wanna walk in the favor of heaven? Amen. All right, if you wanna walk in the favor of heaven, consider this. Oh, stingy people. All right. Community empowers our worship. There's something about singing together. I sing the songs that we sing on Sunday. They get in my head, and I sing them throughout the week. It's not nearly as good as when I sing with you. There is something, and it's not just the quality. However, the quality of song is even better. There's a harmony when I sing with you. I don't sing that good. But whenever I sing here on Sunday, I sound great because my notes are connected to your notes. And there's something about corporate worship that's different than personal worship. There's something about you singing right alongside of me. It would be a sad thing if we all sang our own song. Pastor Dave gets up there and hits, you know, C on the guitar and says, everyone sing, whatever you wanna sing, and you just start singing. It, it, would, be, it would be mayhem. See. This is, this is why we come together corporately, that whenever you take your song and you put it next to my song, your note, and put it next to my note, and we focus our praise in one direction, here's what the Word of God says, God inhabits the praises of His people. I know that God can inhabit the praise of His, of his person, but He inhabits the praises of His people. You know, I don't play guitar that well, but I play it a little bit, 
And I learned a song this week I want to play for you. It's called the C song. I don't know if you know it. It goes like this. Oh, Moses, where are you, Moses? Mo oh, there you are. Am I, do I have to turn something on, or is it? Turn up the, oh, thanks, thanks, smart aleck. I appreciate that. <laughs> Go ring, go back, go ring. Okay. <laughs> I, I know you're thinking, I didn't leave my guitar up there thinking he would use it. <laughs> but I'm your pastor. <laughs> All right, so, so the this, this song I learned this week, it's complicated. It's called the C song. And if you don't know how to play it, I can show you afterwards. It's not easy. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I don't think you had enough enthusiasm there. <laughs> okay, we're gonna try it again. Thank you very much. That is what my worship sounds like during the week. Thank you very much. And here's what your worship sounds like. Give yourselves a hand. All right. Unless maybe you're a little lower. All right, we got, we got low E, and we got hi, hi. Sound like a cricket commercial. All right, and, and so here's what happens. You get in your house, and you're singing. <laughs> And I'm doing C. And you're going, whatever that note is. <laughs> and then someone else is in your house, and you're singing. We're singing all different notes. But here's what happens when we come together. You take those exact same notes, put them side by side. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. That's why corporate worship is so significant, that God inhabits the praises of his people. And when we put our notes right alongside of someone else's notes, when we start to harmonize, and we start to sing together, it does something in heaven. And God looks down and goes, I love that. And God is drawn toward corporate worship. And he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we praise God, we anticipate that God will show up. And when God shows up, he's always here, but he manifests himself. And that's when we say, show up. God manifests himself. And when he does, the miraculous is commonplace. And so if you want God to do a miracle, let me encourage you to do something. Start singing with everybody else. And if you come to church and you're thinking, but I just don't feel like it, let me give you a word of encouragement. Get over it and sing because the person next to you needs your notes. And when we all come together in one accord, singing one song in one direction, God inhabits the praises of his people. And that is his promise. And the last one is this, community empowers our fellowship. In just a little bit, we're going to receive communion. And you can't even say communion and community without seeing the parallels here. Acts 2, verse 46, about halfway through the verse. And it's two different places in Acts chapter 2. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They broke bread. They broke bread. See, it could have said they got together at people's houses and had ice cream. Right? They, they got together in people's houses and they had pizza. They got together, and some of you are, <laughs> woo, out of body experiences right now. <laughs> they got together and they had all kinds of food. But no, 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 they were very specific. They got together for the breaking of bread. They didn't just serve bread, they broke bread. I, I'm going to ask our worship team to come, and I'm going to ask our host to serve you the elements of communion, and we'll continue this thought. When you're served the elements of communion, uh, we come from all different traditions and, and backgrounds, and 
As a result, maybe your tradition, your background is that whenever you serve communion that you take it instantly. And if you decide to do that, we will not be offended at all. But if you'd like to, we encourage you just to kind of hold the elements of communion and we will take communion together. There's gonna be two cups. You may not be used to that. They're stacked on top of each other. Would you make sure that you grab both cups? The first cup has a piece of bread in it and the other one having the juice is right on top of it. And if you would hold that cup for just a little while, we'll take communion together. You see, they broke bread together. They didn't just serve food, they broke bread together. And breaking bread had significance because when they broke bread, they remembered. Jesus said this, remember me. And they broke bread and it reminded them of the many times that Jesus broke bread and he fed thousands of people with just a few loaves, a few fish. They were reminded of the times that he broke bread and ministered to the, the needs of those around him. They're reminded, they remembered that Jesus called himself the bread of life. See, when they broke bread, they were reminded that the disciples met with Jesus just before he was to lay his life down on a cross. And he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. I give it to you. They even remembered those sermons that Jesus taught and everyone got offended by. If you think teaching on generosity is offensive, you should have been at Jesus' church. Because one day he stood up and said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. All right, time, time, time to become Baptist. <laughs> Methodist, Catholic, I don't care. I am getting out of this church. They remembered. And that was why they broke bread together with glad and sincere hearts. It wasn't just breaking bread. And they didn't go, oh, I remember and he died. You remember? He was so good. Do you remember? He died on a cross. I remember. I remember too. And they cry all over their bread. They had glad and sincere hearts. Why were their hearts glad and sincere? They remembered. Not that Jesus died on the cross. They remembered that after he died on the cross, three days later, he rose from the dead. Just like was prophesied and just like he said. This is why you and I are Christians today. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so they got together and they broke bread and they remembered we live in a nation that is divided. I don't know if it's true that it's divided more than any time in our history, but I hear people say that from time to time. And we're divided on multiple issues. It's not just one issue. I mean, we are divided on everything from age. We have, in church, it's so cool, we have people that are older and people that are younger. Outside of the church, here's what can happen though. Someone older next to someone younger, and here's what the younger people could say. They don't know anything. They don't even know how to set the timer on their VCR. <laughs> and old people could say, you know what? They're millennials. Millennials are lazy. That doesn't happen in the church. There's no unity in our nation right now, but God has called his church to unity. And it doesn't matter if you're old or if you're young, if your skin is is peachy white or very dark. It does not matter whether you make $20,000 a year or $200,000 a year. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, and I'll even throw this in. As far as church goes, it doesn't matter if you're confused whether you're male or female. See, there's division the outside of the church, but inside of the church, there has got to be unity. Outside of the church, Democrats and independents and, and Republicans and, and everything in between. 
and people have strong opinions about this and strong opinions about that. And here's one of the problems, that we take that to church with us. But let me tell you that division stays outside the church. When we come inside the church, we are one body in Christ with the same vision, the same purpose, the same message, and the same prayers. We are all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and there is no room for division. And when God's people are in unity, nothing is impossible for them. And if you don't catch anything else today, catch that. When God's people are in unity, nothing is impossible for them. Genesis chapter 11 is one of those chapters that has transformed my life. And it's the story of the Tower of Babel. And it winds up that there's some pagans who are completely out of God's will, who are, are building a tower to get to God, to which I'm thinking, you know, give it your best shot. But God looks down on the circumstance and says, oh, 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 oh. Well, we have an issue that I need to deal with. They're in unity. What do you mean? They're in unity, but they're building a tower that, that they're not supposed to be building. They're, they're not honoring you. They're, they're on their own. They're renegades. And, and, and God says, no, no, they're in unity. You don't understand how, how, how things work in heaven. In heaven's economy, when you're in unity, incredible things take place. When you're in unity, nothing is impossible. And he says, they're in unity. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to come down and I'm going to change their languages. And, and I, I, I'm a science guy. And, and there's all kinds of theories of why we have so many languages. That the, you know, the, the nations kind of pull apart and this over here and that over there. But why would you learn a new language? Why, why would you have your continent float over here? And you go, well, now that we floated over here, I'm going to start speaking this way. And you float over there, you start speaking that way. No, here's what happened. God came down and messed up everyone's languages. He said, by the way, you'll be this and you'll be this. And we started speaking different languages. Why? Because God knew that when people are in unity, nothing is impossible for them. That makes this portion of scripture that I'll seal things up with so powerful. Matthew 18, verse 19, about halfway through the verse in verse 20. And Jesus says this. Keep in mind that, that whenever people were in unity out of God's will, God said, nothing is impossible for them. This is what he says. If two of you in the church, as Christians, agree about anything, if you're in unity, if you're in community, anything you ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three together in my name, there am I with them. Nothing is impossible for people who are unified. Here's the dangerous part. You can be unified out of God's will and nothing is impossible. But I prefer to be unified in the middle of God's will. So in just a minute, we are gonna take communion together. And when we do, we are gonna be unified. All right, I call you to unity. You might sit here today and say, well, I don't even know if I believe in God. Yes, you do. We're in unity. Well, I don't know if I do. It's okay. You don't have to know everything. All right, I, I don't even know if God does miracles. He does. And you believe it too. Deep inside of you, we have something in our DNA that says God does the miraculous. That's why we get angry with him when he doesn't. All right? We can be in unity. In a minute, we're going to take communion. And when we do, it's going to be the perfect environment for God to do the miraculous. Anybody here like to have a miracle in your life? There's something you'd like to see God do for you. Leave your hands up for just a little while. I'm going to look around. All right. Get ready. Because in just a moment, when we take our communion, we are going to remember what God has done. And when we eat the bread, when we break the bread, when we crush the bread, we're going to remember that Jesus that fed 5,000 with a few loaves, that Jesus has said, I am the bread of life, that Jesus that broke bread for his disciples and said, this is my body, I give it to you. We are going to remember that Jesus said, when you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are a part of me. And Jesus, if we are part of Jesus, Jesus is God. He is the miraculous walking among us. And so today would be the perfect day for the miraculous. So with your bread in your hand, I want you to remember what God has done. 
that he died on a cross. Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose again three days later. Death was defeated. My life began. If you need a miracle today, we are in agreement. Would you say this? I agree. Our God does miracles. I agree. Our God does miracles. I agree. Our God does miracles. I agree. Now let's eat the bread together. And let's remember. In a similar way, Jesus took a cup. So this cup is a new covenant. The old is gone. It's all about rules and ritual. But the new has come. It's all about God's love reaching to us. And we are unified because of this. We are brothers and sisters, not because your blood is B positive or A positive or anything negative. The reason we are brothers and sisters is because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and that makes us unified. So let's drink the cup together. My favorite part of communion. Would you look at the empty cup? And it serves as a reminder that you and I serve a Savior who has an empty grave. In fact, you cannot find his tombstone. You cannot find his grave. You can only find the, the grave of another person because he borrowed it for a weekend. And he has risen from the dead. That is why we are Christians today. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you mind standing with me all across this place? And we're going to sing this song again. Where death was arrested and my life began. Would you sing it like you mean it? Would you lift your voice? Would you combine your notes right next to someone else? And, and maybe you're singing in low E and maybe you're singing in high E and maybe you were singing in C. But when we pull this thing together, it is a perfect environment for God's spirit to dwell. So let's sing together. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom.